What's going on YouTube? It's Pete coming in hot again with another video. Wanted to squeeze another one in <laughs> um, <laughs> before the weekend ends because, um, yeah, you already know long hours are coming up. So figured I'd get this one out. But yep, Pete coming in hot. Also known as that guy, Pete, you refuse to fight the gatherings. And what we are here to talk about today is a topic that was um, I was asked to look into by um, Alex. So this video is um, related to the topic you wanted to talk about, which is essentially the um, the six stages of uh, moral development. Um, that's what we're here to talk about today. So. As you can see at the top, I named it um, the ethics of justice and the ethics of care stages of moral development. Uh, this ties into two models put forth by one psychologist who was the mentor and another psychologist who was his student. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over the premise. And we're going to talk about the two models, justice and care, my thoughts on it, and then my conclusion. And as always, as I go through this, I'm going to probably just sprinkle some uh, ad lib and off the cuff type shit so i guess uh you know let's see let's see how this one's received let's see how many feathers i ruffle that's kind of the risk when you do this stuff right let's see what what we can stir up today all right so without further ado let's begin so when we're talking ethics of justice and ethics of care the stages of moral development what's the basic premise of this video well there was a psychologist named kohlberg and Kohlberg argued that there are six stages of moral development that are divided into three phases. The pre-conventional, which is essentially childhood, the conventional, which is more or less adolescence, and the post-conventional, which is pretty much adulthood. Now, when assessing both men and women under Kohlberg's model, Kohlberg concluded that men scored higher in moral development than women based on his metrics. One of his students Gilligan disagreed and said, you can't measure women in male terms, which on the face, I agree. Uh, men and women are different. I always like to say men are from Mars and women are from Venus. They're very different creatures. So comparing them in an identical fashion would be uh, apples to oranges. That being said, when you're looking at a common denominator, such as ethics of justice or ethics of care, how does each one score in those things? All things considered. All right. So what she did is she developed her own model that once again follows the three phases. But instead of a focus on justice, there is a focus on care, compassion, giving a shit, empathy, nurture, this sort of stuff. Right. So what we are going to do is we are going to begin here with justice. So this is pretty much the six stages of justice. What we are looking at is stage one, which is essentially survive. Imagine you're a kid, right? If you're a kid, you don't want to die. You want to eat. You want shelter. You need a place to sleep. So basically, the way you avoid losing those things is obedience and avoiding punishment. That's essentially what this is. Now, on the flip side, you're trying to avoid risks, you're trying to avoid punishment, you're trying to avoid situations that could result in you not surviving. On the flip side, self-interest is another part of it. Gain reward. You are going to put the decisions that benefit the self over decisions that benefit those around you. This is very early in moral development. A kid is kind of in his own little world, right? So. What he's going to do essentially is say, hey, how does this situation benefit me? He's not even really thinking about others in that situation. So basically, risk reward. Avoid the punishment and gain the reward. That's what you're looking to do in the first two stages in the pre-conventional childhood phase of life, right? But then adolescence comes around, right? You're in high school. Everyone's in cliques. Everybody has their groups, you know? So what's it really about? Approval and disapproval from others. Now you start to give a shit what other people think. 
We talk about this all the time in the manosphere. Trying to get as much approval and validation as possible, trying to avoid social disapproval at all costs. At this phase, what we would say is that women really have a very difficult time getting past this because disapproval meant exile from the tribe, and exile from the tribe meant you were bare lunch. While men, they get exiled from the tribe, they may have to go form their new tribe or something like this. So it's a bit different. So what ends up happening, essentially, um, I think, is that both men and women in high school, they're looking to find where they are approved of and avoid where they are disapproved of. But what happens when you get past this conventional adolescent stage and you move on to adulthood? Well, in theory, duty and guilt start to play a role. You have a sense of duty, a sense of doing the right thing because it's right. That's a form of Kantianism. That's one of the three pillars of the light triad alongside um, humanism, which is seeing humans as an end in and of themselves and having faith in humanity, trying to see the good in people versus the bad in people, right? So duty and guilt, law and order, honor systems, code, principles. That's stage four. Stage five is about rights and justice fairness just because something is legal doesn't mean it's morally right or that it's fair so at this level you're you're able to think outside the box a little bit if somebody's technically not breaking the law but something they're doing is morally questionable you're inclined to call it out and say hey that's not fair that's not just that's not right the idea of what universal rights should be for people and then last but not least, you have moral standards and ethics, which is kind of universal principles that we can all kind of agree on. I think personally, um, the easiest way to remember it is um, slack. The ideal way you probably don't want to be on the receiving end of any of this stuff, right? Slack, S-L-A-C-K. You don't want to be stolen from. You don't want to be lied to. You don't want to be assaulted. You don't want to be cheated. And you don't want to be killed. Slack. Universal moral standards and principles, but upholding them for their own sake. Kantianism. It's the right thing to do. Uphold it. And if somebody who's in a position of power, right, is using the legal system to try to get away with shit, and your moral standards clearly dictate, hey, no, what you're doing is wrong, you call them out. Happens all the time. Corrupt governments and shit like this. This is how we hold each other accountable. This is moral development. Accountability. Responsibility. These sorts of things. And basically, um, from what I could gather, just on the cursory read of, um, of Kohlberg's model, um, you know, most men made it to stage four. Most men made it to stage four where they understood law and order. They didn't really question if it was fair or just, or anything like that. They just said, hey, I don't want to fuck with the government. I don't want to break the laws. This, that, and the third. This is most people. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to question shit. This is most people. While for women, they scored at stage three. Approval and disapproval. This is very consistent with what we discuss in the manosphere. Right? Hey, they're going to do what interests the self. They're going to try to survive. Of course, these two things. Yes, men are doing it too. But on top of that, right, there is this desire to gain as much validation and approval as possible while simultaneously avoiding disapproval, right? And with no social norms and stigmas in place, feminism kind of reigns supreme, the journey ends there. And Gilligan was like, well, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like the way that makes me feel. Um, so she went and developed her own model. Over here, care. And pretty much out of the gate, she agrees. Stage one, survive, avoid punishment. Stage two, she agrees. Self-interest, gain reward. She starts to deviate at stage three. At stage three in moral development, she believes that women start to acknowledge a responsibility to others. That she doesn't have just a responsibility to herself. Right? Stage four, she starts to develop self-sacrifice. So allegedly, in the care model, 
she exhibits the moral capacity to sacrifice herself for others. Putting herself in danger and things like this. Right? While stage five, she realizes, well, wait. Up here where I kind of had the sense of self, that was important. But other people are important too. So maybe now I kind of have to remember that, yes, protecting others is important. But remembering that my sense of self, I am a human being as well. Because remember, women see themselves as human beings. Um, but this would be in direct conflict with the concept that men are human doings. Right? Men are not seen as human. They're seen as utilities. So, again, this works from a solipsistic lens, perhaps the sisterhood, or maybe maternal instincts or something like this. But the point is they're balancing themselves with the needs of others around them. And then stage six, the nonviolence principle. Don't hurt anybody. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt others around you. Right? Now, again, um, I believe on her model when I was looking at it, of course, they make it here, here. Um, they make it here. Um, some women make it here. Um, some women struggle here. And women don't always make it to here. The nonviolence principle, from what I understand. Okay? So, Alex, if um, if you want to elaborate more on this, um, you absolutely can. All right? I'm just kind of giving you my, my thoughts as a conversation starter on this. Um, and then I'll pin your comment, of course, as is tradition. As is Canadian tradition. You guys see that episode of South Park, man. That shit's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah, shit's going crazy in Canada right now, by the way. Jesus Christ. Never thought you'd see something like that. But it's kind of good that it's happening. But that's another talk. Anyway, um, putting that to the side, though, let's get back to the topic. So my thoughts on the ethics of justice and care. Right? I think stage one is consistent for both. Both men and women have a drive to survive and also reproduce, but that's a whole nother thing. But avoiding punishment, yeah, it's both in the interest of a little boy and a little girl to uh, avoid punishment. Yeah, that makes sense. Self-interest, doing what's best for yourself, gaining rewards, improving your own lot. Yeah, stage two is consistent for both too. Kids want to be rewarded. They, they are self-interested. They want to do what benefits them. That makes sense. However, this is where I start to diverge. Stage three is better captured by Kohlberg's model. This one. And applicable to both. I think in high school, you got a lot of boys and you got a lot of girls. They don't really know where they fit. They don't really have a sense of self. And so they kind of tie up their sense of self in the approval or disapproval of others. If this person does not approve of me, then I am nothing. If this person approves of me, then I am something. But I think what it is in reality, um, I think for men, it's more just like that. While for women, it's balancing this, um, this, um, this approval and disapproval dynamic with their self-interest. If I can get what is to my own interest without stepping on any toes, I'm going to do that. We talked about this in the social calibration video. This idea of understanding where you are in the hierarchy. Who can I fuck with? Who can I not fuck with? What can I get away with to further my own means? What can I not get away with? Um, so yeah, that's kind of at play here. While men, again, they're more kind of a rational calibration. Logic, A to B. What's the best situation type deal? Right? So then we get to four, self-sacrifice, which she put here. For women under care. I disagree with this. I believe that self-sacrifice is a male trait. Men die protecting women, not the other way around. Men are wired to protect and provide and lead. Women. Women are not wired to protect and provide for men. In fact, it would probably dry them up to do so. Because men, in the eyes of women can be argued to be seen as human doings, not human beings. You're not going to protect and provide for a utility. You're going to protect and provide for a human being. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Number five, the idea of, you know, 
um, also tying into it is, um, you know, duty and guilt, rights and justice versus, you know, balancing self with others and all this shit, right? The question becomes, right, um, do women care about duty and guilt, law and order? Do they care about what's fair? Do they care about morals and ethics as it applies to men? Or do they only care about it when it applies to themselves? Well, given false allegations, divorce court, baby, egg, and cheese, which is basically just abortions, um, etc. The question is, how important is fairness and ethics really? Well, I think ethics and fairness is important to the extent that it benefits the self and also avoids social disapproval. To the extent that it furthers their own means and avoids disapproval along the way, that's the extent to which they care about law and order and fairness and things like this. It kind of reminds me of when a woman will try to use a man's sense of honor against him to sort of get compliance out of him, right? Like, oh, a real man has honor and code and ethics. A real man wouldn't do that to a woman. A real man wouldn't do this. And by doing that, she gets a man to fall in line. Again, to the extent that it benefits her while also simultaneously avoiding social disapproval, she will leverage this. Okay? So that's something that a man must be very wary about. And again, like I said, we're looking at the allegations. Granted, it's only like between 2 and 10%. So you figure somewhere in the middle, maybe like 6% of allegations are actually false, right? Something like that. But... The fact is they do it at all, they do it, um, and they get away with it, which is a problem. Divorce court, right? That's another thing. Um, would you do that to another human being if you were concerned with what's fair? Now, there are men that lack morals as well that would do the same shit, and we're not saying that, but I'm just saying 80% of divorces initiated by women do you think they care about what's fair or do you think they care about self-interest and being able to do this, what benefits their self-interest, without attracting this disapproval? Exactly. So, very, very important. And in on aside from that, though, I also see laws being made based on feelings and self-interest. There are now more women in Congress than there have ever been. All right. And now we're seeing laws. Um, about these types of things you know it's, it's more so in canada too like making laws about pronouns all right listen i'll i'll be respectful I'll, I'll you know whatever if you're my friend i will use your pronouns and all that shit but again making laws mandating it again very questionable territory not the type of laws that men would make because fairness but Again, you also have to understand the world is run by psychopaths. <laughs> so perhaps uh, a lot of the men that are in power are psychopaths, and thus they have complete disregard for these things, and maybe they, they would get in league with, um, with this side for the sake of furthering their own agendas. But that's another talk as well. But again, making laws based on feelings, and over the past 60 years with the birth control pill, sexual liberation... Female empowerment, I see the removal of norms to minimize stigma, to minimize this. Example, being a hoe used to attract a lot of this. Now, it gets this approval. So, you get to change the way society is run by regulating the stigmas or lack thereof. Again, this doesn't sound like a society... This gynocentric society, it doesn't sound like a society that values fairness. It doesn't value order. It doesn't value moral standards and ethics. It values self-interest and avoiding disapproval. Looking good and getting what you want. That's what it sounds like to me. And again, just last as an afterthought, and given domestic violence data, I'm not really seeing this whole non-violence principle crap. Don't hurt anyone. Again, when you look at domestic violence stats, um, women are slightly, only slightly, less likely to abuse men than the other way around. So, despite that fact, there are more female battered 
um, shelters than there are for men. Okay, yet men get abused almost just as much as women do. Again, I think it's a little bit easier to beat the shit out of somebody when you see them as a human doing, when you see them as a utility, right? So a lot of these guys who are battering women, they are psychopaths. They are sociopaths. We know that these guys are bad fucking news. We've made that concession. We are aware of it. The difference is, though, that gets taken seriously. But when we come back around and say, hey, in all fairness, right, in all fairness, on the other side, this is happening. You're misogynistic. You're a patriarch. You're a this, that, and the third. Shut the fuck up. No uterus, no opinion, right? So, yeah. I guess now, in conclusion, Kohlberg's model, in my opinion, is better. Right? I think it's definitely much more accurate when measuring morality and how it evolves. Right? I think, for example, surviving self-interest matches. Responsibility to others, I think that integrates into duty. Balancing self with others, I think that goes into rights and justice. Nonviolence principle that probably goes into moral standards. That's slack. Don't steal, don't lie, don't assault, don't cheat, and don't kill. Boom, there it is. So, again, this is more like semantics, in my opinion. But I think women can learn the importance of stages four, five, and six. But the question is, do they want to? This is like that rational calibration question, right? Do they really want to? Right? Are the fathers present to teach them from what we see self-interest outweighs all but social disapproval if one can maintain approval and get what they want without the need to adhere to duty fairness and principles path of least resistance right if you can get what you want your reward and minimize the disapproval you're going to get from others. That is, minimize your chances of being exiled from the tribe and becoming bear lunch. If you can do that without having to worry about duty, guilt, rights, justice, moral standards, and ethics, you're going to do that. But if a bunch of social norms and stigmas are in place that force you to acknowledge this, then you have no choice but to take the long way around, which is how it used to be. But feminism got rid of all that. For women, at least. They still hold men accountable to this. They still hold men accountable to this. But they do not hold women accountable to this. And why would they? Simps allow it to happen. So, at the same token, however, I can acknowledge Gilligan's stages 3, 4, 5, and 6 in the maternal sense. What do I mean? What I mean is... She has a responsibility to her baby, her children. She will sacrifice for her kids. She will balance her own needs with the needs of her kids. And she will never, unless she's Casey Anthony <laughs> or a psychopath, engage in violence against her kids. Um, yeah. But that exception aside, yeah. There really isn't the context where they see men as human beings. So therefore, these types of things don't really... Again, they don't care about men like that. They just don't. But they can be taught to for their own benefit. Because again, if you understand how men think and you actually embrace that, then your odds will improve. But at the end of the day, when you look at things like Planned Parenthood and support for it, that also reveals a lot, right? Supposedly, you have this maternal instinct, but many of you are very ready, willing, and able to go make a baby egg and cheese. Why is that? But as always, we have to acknowledge sociopaths who have no morality. That is the outlier for sure, by comparison. Okay? And that's pretty much all I've got. So let's do a quick recap. What was this video about? Ethics of justice versus ethics of care. The tenets of morality men are governed by and the tenets of morality women are governed by, allegedly. There was a psychologist named Kohlberg. He argued there's six stages of moral development. Survive, self-interest, approval versus disapproval, duty and guilt, rights and justice, moral standards and ethics. Divided into three phases. Pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional. Post when he assessed both men and women, he concluded that most men scored higher in moral development than women. 
Most men made it to here, honor the law, but don't really question it too much and care about moral standards. While women, they kind of stopped here, approval versus disapproval, because they could still fulfill their interests, avoid this disapproval without having to give a shit about this. All right. Gilligan, his student, did not like that. She disagreed fundamentally because she said, hey, you can't look at men and women the same way. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So she developed her own model and said, hey, survive in self-interest, I'll give you that. But at stage three, it's a responsibility to others that compels her. Then self-sacrifice, then balancing self with others, and then, of course, the nonviolence principle. Don't hurt anyone. In my opinion, I think both agree on stages one and two, so no argument there. Stage three is better captured here. Self-sacrifice and all this stuff that they're talking about here, these are male traits. Perhaps in the maternal instinct, it is a female trait, but beyond maternal, no. Because men are seen as human doings, not human beings. So it's very, very difficult to imagine um, that outside of maternal instinct and perhaps the sisterhood to some degree, unless intersexual competition compels her to not give a fuck about her competitor, thus throwing her under the bus, there is some of this in, at play. But when you look at false allegations, you look at divorce court, you look at the baby egg and cheese clinic, um, again, considering what they voted in, considering the things that they fight for, how much do they really care about law and order? How much do they really care about fairness and principles? Or is it just feelings and given the moment how they feel, what's going to maximize their self-interest while simultaneously avoiding social disapproval? I think that's what's going to happen. And domestic violence data seems to suggest that this eh, its kind of a moot point. So again, Kohlberg's model, I think it's better. I think women can learn these things, rationally calibrate. You can learn these things. There are women who do value these things because they were taught these things by dads in the household. Yes. But out of the box, if in the absence of a father, which is an increasing trend in the West, self-interest and the development probably stops here because they realize I can get whatever I want and as long as I avoid this, I won't feel too bad about it. <laughs> so why do I give a shit about any of this? And this is what happens. Okay? So, yeah. When you're thinking about the duty, the fairness, and the principles, the path of least resistance dictates ignore these things. And as I said, I can acknowledge Gilligan's points from a maternal sense, but not much else. I can't see um, women embodying these things when looking at men. Perhaps in the sisterhood, I can see it, but looking at men, I don't think they feel this way about men. I just don't. Um, but yeah, Planned Parenthood, all that, it reveals much about how much these things really matter. But we must acknowledge outliers like sociopathic men who also don't really give a shit about this stuff. But men, it seems, have some semblance of honor, code, and order. They care about that. Women don't really care about that. In fact, they'll weaponize honor against men to leverage and get compliance from men. A real man wouldn't do that. A real man does this, and so on and so forth. Okay? And Alex, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about this topic. So let's continue it in the comments section. As I said, I'll pin your comment as soon as you um, comment on the video. I hope you found my opinion insightful. Um... Probably not as detailed as I would have liked, but I guess that's what the comment sections are for nowadays. Um, but yeah, this one's probably going to ruffle some feathers too. Probably going to get some subs, lose some subs. That's the game, right? But um, yeah, feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike. Call me an asshole. Whatever you do, don't report the video. It's good information and it helps men understand kind of what's going on around us. Not understanding this information can really lead to bad outcomes like self-deletion. We don't want that. We definitely don't want men to do that. We want them to acknowledge this for what it is, accept it for what it is, self-improve in spite of this, and still find meaning. Still find meaning outside. Okay? And, yep, this is just going to get added onto the Comprehensive Manosphere Library. Um, if you like what you're hearing, go ahead and sub. If you don't like what you're hearing and you are a sub, you can unsub. It's totally fine. I'm not interested in money. I'm not interested in clout. I'm not interested in any of that. Uh... The, the message is what matters to me, and hopefully it helps somebody. And if my message doesn't resonate, somebody else in the space will resonate with you, and at least you get your information somewhere, and that's good enough for me. 
And ladies, if you're watching, um, I understand this was a tough one for you to watch. Yeah. But we're starting to realize kind of how we're really seen in the world and why we are as disposable um, as, as it looks. And uh, yeah, hopefully that allows you to just kind of, I don't know, exercise that empathy muscle a little bit, understand kind of where we're coming from, and maybe, you know, shift course a little bit so you can improve your own results in life when interacting with the opposite sex. As always, I am that guy, Pete, that you refuse to invite to gatherings. I'll definitely catch you for the next one. It's probably going to be a few days, but um, yeah, I'll see you around. Later.